foot goddess right at the hip. <laughs> All right. So we are going to move into imperialism and imperialist war making specifically. So as this comes up, what is imperialism? Here is a, here's a definition. Imperialism is the practice, theory, or attitude of maintaining or extending power over foreign nations, particularly through expansionism, employing both hard power, military and economic power, and soft power, diplomatic power, and cultural imperialism. Imperialism focuses on establishing or maintaining hegemony and a more or less formal empire. Hegemony. So what do folks make of, of this definition? Is this clear to folks or is there anything that, that seems a bit confusing? What does hegemony mean? Hegemony, yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah, hegemony is is a term coined by um Hey, come on in, what's up? Um by an uh, an Italian theorist, Antonio Gramsci. Um and hegemony, um, it's it's one of those words that in my mind is 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 at this point like so basic that it's sort of hard to define but hegemony is is effectively when um when a culture or a state is ubiquitous in its power right where it's everywhere it, it's it's totally dominating right um i'm trying to think of 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 power good analogy say that again power over yeah. yeah, yeah, complete power over, I mean, so you think about, you know, Christian hegemony in the U.S., right? Christianity, it's not necessarily the case that, like, you have to be Christian to be in the U.S., but it is this hege hegemonic power in that it is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's It structures so many of the interactions that we have, so many of the, the forms of media that we consume, um, it's so constant and ever present that it it's reached this level of hegemony, this uh, this ascendant supremacy and complete domination over over cultures and countries. So uh, so imperialism is the attempt to make sure that one's own culture or one's own state has that kind of power over whatever place you know is is uh, you know is being conquered or controlled. Does that make some sense? Mm -hmm. Like words resources as well. Words resources, exactly. It's head hegemony is something that must be imposed, right? People don't invite uh, total control uh, from others on themselves, but hegemony is imposed through these different instruments. This this definition uh, parses it into hard power and soft power. Um, right, saying that there's military and economic pressure is one kind of power and diplomatic pressure or cultural imperialism, right, the importation, right, I remember we'll get to, Emily's going to talk about Cuba in a bit, but I remember uh, being there and seeing um, like American music videos in Cuba and seeing some folks uh, who had like some designer belts and, you know, different different pieces of like American uh, luxury consumerist capitalist culture and uh, and seeing that through through media, through cultural imperialism, it was shaping the way that some Cuban folks were thinking about politics. Um, right. And, and spreading that sense that, well, you know, maybe capitalism will, you know, is the way to, um, you know, to improve our lives uh, without recognizing that these, the, the culture that you're consuming is not necessarily representative of what the reality on the ground is. You know, if you move to America, if uh, you take part in a capitalist political political economy, you're not just going to be dripped out in, you know, Gucci and drive a Lamborghini and whatever, but, but our cultural <laughs> imperialism is selling that idea to other people. Right. And that's, that's one function of, of imperialism. That's part of the project. Mm -hmm. So is that, oh my gosh, I remember when I, oops, you there. No, yeah, go ahead, Katie. 
Yeah, no, I remember just thinking about like materialism and capitalism. Like when I lived in China, like Louis Vuitton was huge. Like if like the mother of one of my students in my school had like a Louis Vuitton bag, like that was a big thing, you know, or like Starbucks was everywhere or like McDonald's and KFC. And so all these like American brands were a big deal, like to consume, you know, like if you took your child to like McDonald's or KFC, or if you went to Starbucks and got the special like dessert or latte that week, like that was, you know, I mean, it was, it was a visual like sign that you were somebody, you know, or you had this power or this like money. Um, I think someone had said like in a previous week how, you know, China really, it's not really a communist, it's like capitalist communist um, as far as like the country and like even like the one child policy doesn't apply anymore. Um, but yeah, just like brands, I remember were a real big deal. So um, yeah, yeah, that, cool. that, that like capitalism, like I like, yeah, idolatry, like just wanting to be associated with those big brands. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, that's that's a great example. Yeah. So we'll we'll continue to hone in on what this is as we provide examples throughout the study. So this is uh this is a political cartoon from 1899 called The White Man's Burden. Mm -hmm. And uh and it mm -hmm. should be very disturbing to look at. Um, but this is, this is, uh, this is when imperialism is in modern, you know, it's modern iteration in Europe is beginning to take shape. And in order for something so, uh, so global, so dominant that requires, uh, arraying, uh, a, a massive range of, of economic and political power, um, you need, you need, uh, you need cultural formations you need ideologies, you need narratives in which to embed yourself, your country and the people over which you're trying to exercise power. And so this is uh, this is one iteration of it, um, of what justified imperialist uh, violence in other countries is that, uh, so, I mean, I, I don't want to just explain it for folks, but maybe if, if folks might like pick out one or two things that you're kind of noticing um, about what this what this comic seems to be suggesting i'm noticing the uh, writing on the boulders mm -hmm. uh, right. i i guess they're, they're they're supposed to be uh superstition oppression barbarism ignorance vice i guess they're supposed to be overcoming that going to greater heights yeah uh, I can't quite see what's on the upper part of that range, but all these boulders have a label. Mm -hmm. Totally. At, yeah, at the top of the mountain, Richard, is civilization. Oh, that, oh is that what that is? So, so the, the <laughs> white man, the British and the Americans have to carry all of the people of color um, to civilization. That's, our, that's the white man's burden. Ah. It, it does remind me of Gandhi's retort you know, the, the famous, you know, they asked Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he famously said, I think it would be a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Mary, right? Yeah, Mari. Mari, yeah. Did you have something? Yeah, I think just like the psychology behind the narrative of thinking that like it's a burden for white people who are in like colonizing these countries that didn't even ask them to be there in the first place is like yeah. wild for them to even believe that this is right. Like this is what's happening when it, it's it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Well, and yeah. the the um Can the I car the camera oh yeah sorry <laughs> um the cartoon is suggesting that the people in the baskets are getting a free ride to civilization. Yeah, and really, I mean. Mm. white men are getting mm -hmm. civilization on the back riding i mean the white men are the ones riding in the basket in in reality and yeah. like the irony that all these boulders that they're they're overcoming like they're 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 um they're putting that on 
other people. Like they're not mm -hmm. removing that. They're adding more of that. Mm -hmm. Totally. Exactly. That's yeah, a I, really just... good point. It reminds me of the current, we, we, you know, we can point out that usually right now, every Trump or Republican accusation is actually a confession. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the accusation or the this you know the, the what they're trying to say is actually the opposite. Yeah, yeah, and I'll just I'll just pop over to the next slide real quick because Hannah brought up a great point. So this is another <laughs> another comic, uh, which is a, a sort of you know uh, ironic parody of that one. Mm -hmm. It said the white you know, and there's a question mark in parentheses next to white man's burden. So right, mm -hmm. is it? The white man's burden or is it actually you know these uh the colonized world um who's mm -hmm. actually carrying uh the white man mm -hmm. as such so yeah great mm -hmm. points mm -hmm. that's uh john bull that's the the english you know caricature or whatever and then behind i think is belgium and france mm -hmm. yeah so um American imperialism um, has has touched um, you know a number of places. This is not at all an exhaustive list. Just places I could think of, um, just in my own memory, that these are these are spots that um, America has has intervened with some sort of of violence. Um, and the list would be a lot longer than that if I could find like a you know, an exhaustive one, but just to, to show that these are, these are some of the places and we're going to discuss in detail some of these in a moment, but just to give a sense of, of the global nature of it, right. Of, of there not being really a continent untouched, um, by, by us imperialism. Um, yeah. So I, I asked Nate cause Nate is Nate's spent some time, um, in Latin America, uh, engaging with folks, experiencing colonization and uh, and he has some some experiences and some thoughts that I thought would be helpful to share. And then uh, Emily's going to share some stuff about Cuba too. Um, and so we'll just like focus in on these for a moment um, as sort of test cases for how for the way that imperial the form the shape it can take at times. Um, so yeah, Nate, if you want to take it away. Um, I I don't want to talk too long. Connor, you want to just play that sure. song? This is a satiric, yeah. it's very much a satiric protest song about the Panama Canal. So let's just listen to a minute. Yeah, you got to click on Yankee Go Home. We can't really hear it that well, Connor. So you can't hear it? No, yeah, we can't hear it that well. Barely. Yeah, I don't, does it have the lyrics on there? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Down. Go down to the bottom. I think the lyrics are down at the bottom. Yeah, yeah right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can you can kind of see the lyrics, right? The Panama Canal, it's ours forevermore. I don't give a damn if they don't like it. The Panama Canal, it's ours forevermore. And let the you you can see what he says. Um, for anybody that doesn't know that that derogatory term Dagos comes from supposedly Diego, who were the Spanish sailors, and then we we shortened it to Dago and started applying it to Spanish and Portuguese, and then later Italians, anybody from Southern Europe. And that was a racist term that was used. Um, and in this case, we're using it towards the people in Panama. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just ask a general question. Does anybody know how the country of Panama was formed? <laughs> Say again, I'm sorry. Is Roosevelt somewhat related to this answer? Absolutely. They paid. They paid a mercenary army from a from a state in Colombia um, to to kind of declare independence, and then they drew a line where Panama it was a state. It was part of Colombia, the country, and they just drew a line at the at what's now the southern border to Panama and said to the Colombians, "Don't you dare! This is an independent country now." 
And basically, they just stole that part of Colombia from Colombia to create <laughs> Panama in order to build the canal. Mm. So, so Panama was created in order to build the canal. I took it, I took it, I took it as a line in this song. Um, so that that's kind of like the obvious, um, uh, you know, like one of the more egregious examples of U.S. imperialism in Latin America, although there have been hundreds of examples. We can go to the other link now, Connor. And I'm sorry you can't hear the song. If you want to, you know, click on it later and listen to it. It's, it's catchy, unfortunately. Um, you got... Yeah. So this was from Harvard, uh, the Harvard Latin American Studies uh, website. And if you page down, you can just kind of see, you know, like we'll go slow now. Um, Emily's going to talk a little bit about Cuba, but you can see the interventions. These are the direct interventions in Cuba, not the indirect, the occupations, Dominican Republic, the same. Um, the one, one statistic that I think kind of freaks people out, in 1965, where did the United States have the most troops in the world? of most U.S. troops. There were more troops in the Dominican Republic than there were in Vietnam. Good grief. Yeah. So, um, and Grenada, Grenada, everybody should remember, that's when uh, Reagan, the Marines got bombed in Beirut. They lost 200 people in Beirut, and Reagan yeah. diverted the boat on the way home in order to distract attention from the fact that 200 Marines had just been blown up in Beirut and he invaded Grenada supposedly to rescue some um, some U.S. you know uh, medical students, right? Um, the United States declared in the 1820s that this was our hemisphere, and ever since then we've acted like it. Our country has repeatedly invaded um, over time. It's invaded Mexico several times. 1914 was only one of the times um, they invaded the northern part of Mexico. You know, like we we don't we don't really think about it that much, but we stole half of Mexico. Half of Mexico was taken in order to create 13 of our states in 1848. Sorry, that's not listed here. You can keep going down. The other thing that I think we don't think about is um, is the indirect interventions, you know, like the fomenting of coups. And, you know, the famous the most famous one was probably in Guatemala in 1954. But over time, the United States has, you know, basically trained the people to commit coups and take over governments. Um, you know, there was a big one in, in Nicaragua in uh, the third in 1930s. Um, at the end of the intervention, um, they don't have it here, but the United States occupied Nicaragua. And at the end, they installed a dictator by the name of Anastasio Somoza. And mm -hmm. Franklin mm -hmm. Delano Roosevelt is very famous for having said, he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. Um, so the the attitude towards this part, this hemisphere, has always been very kind of hegemonic, to use uh, Gramsci's term. Um, this is our hemisphere, and any perceived, you know, outside forces, and usually these interventions in the in the last part of the, you know, since since World War II, the interventions have all been justified in terms of anti-communism, um, even up until and through the 80s and, and 90s, um, it was always in terms of keeping the, the communist, the Russian influence, later the Cuban influence out of Central America. So that's just a short list. I don't want to take too much of the time, but um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments about this. It's, it's you know, it's when you put it in its totality, it's it's kind of Unfortunately, sad because in our country we don't think about this hardly at all. How violent we've been toward the rest of our hemisphere, and how kind of we just assume that that's the way it's supposed to be because of something supposedly that President Monroe created in the 1820s. Like, what gave us that right, and and why you know has do we just kind of accept it? And it's really unfortunate. Um, I guess one a last thing is I, you know, like a lot of my life has been to try to like interrupt this, or I don't know what the good term would be to contest this, to provide solidarity with places that we are intervening in, to provide material support. 
I've I've lived in um, Nicaragua, in Mexico, in in Colombia, in Brazil. I worked with the Presbyterian Church Volunteer and Mission Program in Brazil um, during the military government in Brazil in the in the 80s, as the military government came to an end. A lot of my work has been around trying to provide either solidarity or material support or political opposition and organizing political opposition, selling Nicaraguan coffee in the United States in the 80s, that kind of thing. Um, there are ways we can try to interrupt it, but the forces that we're going against are obviously pretty strong. Um, yeah. I've taken yeah. a lot of groups to Central America, like five or six different groups, religious groups, um, to visit Mexico and also Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, Nicaragua, um, just to kind of see what's going on themselves so that they could make, you know, their own determinations about what in that in those days, the, the Reagan government was saying about what was actually happening. And then they could see the reality for themselves was not that way. Obviously, mm -hmm. our church does that to a, to a great extent with the people that have gone to Cuba. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, I feel like this is a huge issue in our country that we really don't talk about very much is the hegemony that we have exerted over Latin America, and we just kind of accept it as that's just normal. Mm -hmm. In addition, Nate, we have over 800 uh, military bases around the world. Well, and one still in, in, a, in, in Cuba, of all places, and I don't know how long that lease is supposed to last. I think it's expired, but we're still there, mm -hmm. right? No, I'll, I'm going to speak to that, so... You're giving me a... then you're then you're on Emily. I'm sorry I took a long time. No, that was great. Thank you so much, Nate. Yeah, right. Emily, go. Well, and I'm just thinking as Nate's talking, we're a good team because my what I where I went was very personal and very um, just some things I have learned from from being in Cuba. Um, so first of all, I want everybody to think for just a minute. If you're, give me, I'm taking a survey here. You're overseas someplace and somebody asks you what nationality you are. And you say, I'm, so how do you answer that question for yourself? And I want to see hands. Who said I'm an American? I mean, which I think most of us do. Um, you know, we're Americans. It's the United States of America. We're in North America. Uh, Canada's in North America. They're Canadians. And Mexico's in North America. And they're Mexicans. And Brazil is in South America. And they're Brazilians. But we're Americans. You know, we got the whole two continents, not a country. <laughs> so I just raise that to show how the, the mindset that we it's in the air we breathe. It's in the water we drink. You know, we don't even see it in ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I've been aware of that because Cubans don't call us Americans. They call us North Americans, which I'm not sure the Canadians like. Uh, mm -hmm. The Cuban, the Cuban word is Yuma. Oh, uh, and I don't, it had some story where it came from, that, but that's a slang term for people from the United States. Um, but they're very careful not to call us just plain Americans. And you've got Jose Marti, who was, who they called the apostle, and he belonged to the Americas, and his tomb in, uh, in Santiago is um, statues of people all over North and South America, including Abraham Lincoln. Um, so American imperialism, it's in the air we breathe and the water we, water we drink. Um, the other example that I wanted to talk about is a little Cuban history and a little American history. And thanks for that cartoon from 1899, because let's go back to that same period. In fact, let's go back 1868. Um, just a minute, I'm gonna share if I, yeah, there's that, can I share screen now? Oh, um, yeah, let me. Connor. Okay. Yeah, so I think I have to make you a host real quick. Yeah, make me a co-host. Yeah. There you go. Now you should be able to share.
Okay. Um, whoops. Oh dear, just a minute. We're if you go up to meeting sure practices. <laughs> yeah, if you click just on just a minute, meeting, let me top of the screen. Uh nice. Is this working or is this worth it? And I'm getting as your low. screen sharing. Oh dear. You know, this may not be worth doing. Anyway, um okay. This guy is um Carlos Manuel de Cespedes, who the Cubans say is the father of their country. And he was like George Washington, uh, who's he led their country into um, a war against the Spanish, their colonial power. And um, like George Washington, he was owned a plantation. Like George Washington, he owed the slaves worked on that plantation. Uh, what Cespedes did was call his slaves together and um, say, okay, I'm going to go fight the Spanish. You all are free. If you want to come with me, and fight the Spanish, fine. And that was the beginning of the war against Spain. Uh, and within about a month, there were thousands of um, Cubans fighting the Spanish, most of them slaves that were now free. And uh, the fact of all these fighting ex-slaves changed Cuban history in a very interesting way, as you can well imagine. But um, Cubans fought the Spanish from 1868 to 1898 mm -hmm. in three different wars. It's 30 years. It's, you know, children whose parents died, they grew up and they fought. Um, so then we had the Spanish-American War. That lasted seven months. So April of 1898, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders and San Juan Hill and the Americans in the, it remembered the Maine and invaded Cuba. And seven months later, the Spanish um, surrendered. And I had, this is the one picture I wanted. And of course, it's the one that's not showing. Just give me one, one minute, because I really did want this particular picture. Remind you of walking around down there. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is, I had this all set up. Mm -hmm. Should have sent, I should have given it to uh, mm -hmm. Connor. Is it in a PowerPoint? Well. There we go, try this. There we go. Okay, this is the photo that was taken as Spain surrendered. And I want you to look very closely because the question is who is not in the room? And the answer is no Cubans. Mm -hmm. So after fighting Spain for 30 years, Spain surrenders to the Americans. And the American army was on the surrounding um, Santiago, Cuba, where this took place, to keep the Cuban army out of the surrender thing. And I don't know how many Cubans have told me that story. I mean, they're, they're still very pissed about this. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. now, what, what happened with that? Uh, the, when this happened, then Spain lost Cuba. The U.S. got Puerto Rico, they got the Philippines, they got Guam. The um, U.S. soldiers stayed in Cuba until 1903, five, five years. And then to get them to leave, the Cubans accepted the um, a sort of puppet government that the U.S. set up 
mm. accepted the fact that the thing called the Platt Amendment, which meant that, which said any, that U.S. controlled the foreign affairs of Cuba, it, any law the Cubans passed that the U.S. didn't like was null and void. And the U.S. got this uh, naval base, a place called Guantanamo. And the treaty, and they, U.S. is paying rent. They're paying $5,000 a year. Um, US, the Cubans don't, don't cash the check, by the way. But um, the <laughs> treaty that gives the U.S. Guantanamo, to answer your question, is good until both sides agree that it will be over. Mm -hmm. So until the U.S. agrees that they don't want Guantanamo anymore, they've got it. They wrote the treaty. That's what the treaty says. Um, the Cubans. And if we want to talk church history, the Cuban ch Protestant churches, which had begun in the 1890s as an anti-Spanish way, um, were taken over by the U.S. churches. The Presbyterian churches in Cuba were, didn't even have their own presbytery. They were part of the Presbytery of South Florida. Uh, the pension funds from Presbyterian pastors in Cuba went to the Presbyterian pension things in Philadelphia. And when the U.S., after the, after the revolution, after the, when the blockade went on, and the U.S. cut off funds being sent to Cuba, Presbyterian Church agreed, did not send those Cuban pastors their pensions, even the part they had put in of their own money, much less the matching funds from the church. So it was that was until um, about 15 years ago, they finally they got the Presbyterian Church finally gave them their money, and most of them were dead at that point. Mm -hmm. um, Emily, would you say a role uh, quickly about the uh, Catholic Church and their role during the uh same era yeah let me stop the sharing here and that might think richard i i couldn't hear what you said say it again. I was, if just say a word about the uh, catholic church and their role on the island during that same era okay well catholic church came to cuba in 1492 with columbus and um was very much the church in cuba for uh, the time, but the Catholic Church, particularly in Cuba, really had no interest in dealing with most of the Cubans. So they um, totally ignored the Africans and uh, totally ignored the Chinese laborers that came, which is one of the reasons why the African religions are so strong in Cuba and Brazil and some of the others. Um, and that's, that's a whole fascinating discussion. But um, the, but Officially, the Catholic Church was the only church. Um, and the Catholic Church pretended that the African religions didn't exist. It was like, I, I had a priest one time to tell me, uh, I'd ask about a place where there was a, an altar to Yamaya. And uh, the priest said he had no idea what it was, where it was. He didn't know what I was talking about. And then his assistant, came up to me after the priest had left and told me exactly where where to go and what to, who to talk to. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'll pretend like I don't know that it exists. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thanks. Um, but then, the, just uh, hang on a minute, then the Protestants came as an independent church, as, as their own Cuban Protestant churches, were taken over by the U.S. Protestant churches, and in 1959, became their own Cuban churches again. Um, and um, so that's that's the short version. Mm -hmm. Right, awesome. Richard, does this fit with your understanding? Yeah, yeah. And I, I was just wondering also how closely they the Catholic Church was aligned with the uh, Spanish during oh, the absolutely. century. Mm -hmm. at, at the time of the revolution, for example, a lot of the priests were Spanish, not mm -hmm. Cuban. Mm -hmm. And they left Cuba after the 1959 revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the Protestants in Cuba who were basically the upper middle class, um, 
Cubans. Um, the poor Cubans were, and, and the darker Cubans tended not to be Protestant or Catholic. And um, the a lot of the Protestants left Cuba and came to the U.S., mm -hmm. aided by both the Catholic Church and Church of Service. Um, so this was the... Uh, and I one time a pastor in Cuba said for a while there we weren't churches we were travel agents people would come <laughs> come to church for a week and then a week later go to the U.S. embassy and say I'm being discriminated because I'm a Christian and I want to go to Miami and away they go. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Emily, um, we, we need to move on to get to some other stuff, but would you be able to say something like super brief about like just how the revolution uh, interacted with imperialism and how imperialism is continuing to affect the island today? I know there's a ton in that, but, you know, something, oh. something quick. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Sorry. My, my final sentence, which I didn't get to, was that U.S. defines the Cuban revolution in terms of communism and capitalism. And the Cubans tend to define it as the end of the struggle for independence this time from the U.S. So uh, there's there's that um, nationalism as opposed to. Um, um, but the U.S., you know, five days before Trump left office, he said Cuba was a list on the list of states to sponsor terrorism, which means Cuba can't interact with the world financial market. Um, we can't go to Cuba as a tourist. We have you can go as a group, but not just to get on a plane and go and, and you know fly on the beach. Um, and that's U.S. law, and it has been going on for sixty years. And the idea is to uh, try and make Cubans suffer economically. Um, they bombed them. They've uh, dropped. Uh, germ warfare. They tried to kill all the pigs. I mean, there's been a whole series of biological and, and economic warfare go on for the last, ever since 1949, 50s to 9. Um, but yeah. I can go on and on, but I won't. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Emily. Yeah. So these are just examples, right? These are by no means exhaustive of any of the specific places that have been discussed. Um, and certainly there's so, so many more examples, but just wanted to take some time to engage with those. Um, and then I just want to talk about Africa really briefly. Um, so this is an article from People's World, which is uh, a, a reformation of the daily worker, um, uh, you know, an old, uh, you know, kind of union, uh, working class leftist uh, paper. Um, and so they just say some some interesting stuff about how U.S. imperialism is operating in Africa. And so I'll just read some of this. Um, it says, the Horn of Africa consists of eight countries, Uganda, Sudan, South Sudan, Kenya, Eritrea, Djibouti, Ethiopia, and Somalia. These countries are victims of international interventions and interference that is causing extreme destabilization in the region, from Djibouti to Eritrea to Somalia and Ethiopia. Western imperialists continue to support dictators and block any attempt at independence, while the Western-backed Gulf states are transforming the region into a battlefield against not only Iran, but each other. Talk some say some stuff about Cold War and how the U.S. was interested in positioning itself on the continent. This region is of geopolitical importance, hence the U.S. interference. The Republic of Djibouti is loca located on the African shore of the Red Sea at the southern entrance of the important waterway which passes through the Suez Canal in Egypt. This tiny state is nestled in between Ethiopia and Somalia. Although one of the world's smallest countries, Djibouti currently hosts more U.S. military personnel than any other African nation. Roughly 4,000 U.S. military personnel on the continent are temporarily deployed to Djibouti and have been there for years. Um, I mentioned some, some other stuff. Um, and I, I want to get down to these, the, what they see as the key ramifications of the U.S.'s 
uh, misguided imperialist policy, our infringement on the sovereignty of peoples and nations, flagrant breach of international law, interference in inter internal affairs and of other countries, a resort to intimidation and the logic of force, inducing paralysis of regional and international forums to render them susceptible to domination, invoking crises, conflicts, and polarization in order to manage the resulting chaotic situation, increasing attitudinal and cultural norms of demonization, condemnation, sanctions, and punishment. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting information here about uh, about AFRICOM and the U.S.'s various tactics of control. Um, and so I just want to want to bring that up for a second. Folks may not know about this, about the United States Africa Command, uh, which is in 53 of 54 African nations. Um, and they are quite expansive um, in terms of how much they're funded, uh, the amount of personnel that, uh, you know, that's on the continent and the range of operations that they um, carry out. Um, there's so there's, you know, each of the branches of the military have their own particular African iteration. Well, not African, but existing on the continent. Uh, you have Special Operations Command, these various task force. And there are all these, these programs. Um, and down here we get to operations. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that are, are don't make the news, right? Um, the U.S.'s operations in Africa and all the ways in which it's um, orchestrating uh, political and, and cultural community life, um, economic life in ways that are uh, amenable to the U.S.'s interests, exerting this kind of imperialist control through military occupation of these territories. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to to see some faces to be like these are real people <laughs> doing this. Um, you know, four thousand people in Djibouti, four thousand militants. You know, they all have faces and names, and uh, and their bodies represent an existential threat uh, to the safety of of the people in Africa. Um, and so, like like Dave was saying, um, over eight hundred bases around the world, U.S. military bases, uh, and these are. These are some of those, um, and uh, and just yeah, just interesting to see the breadth, right? And in many of these places, uh, there's there's many bases. It's not that there's just one kind of representative base in each country, but uh, but each of these has you know has a few military bases, has a significant military presence. Um, it's just so they Russia, or the big areas that there's no bases. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, things like like the Middle East, you know, in terms of, of imperialism in, in our, I guess, I guess my lifetime, uh, some of the most significant, uh, violent, destructive expressions of, you know, of that policy has been in the wars in the Middle East. Um, at least, um, you know, almost a million people have been killed directly by war in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and Pakistan since 2001, including uh, over 400,000 civilians. It's so interesting to see those numbers over against how many U.S. troops have been killed. 7,000 U.S. troops, right? You, you see the asymmetry. That's a, that's a word that we've been using throughout this study. Um, the asymmetry of the violence, right? This, this is not the violence of equals. This is one side has the capacity to send in planes and bombs and drones and kill people from afar, um, you know, and the others seem almost incidental deaths relative to, to the numbers of the people who are, who are suffering the imperialist violence. Indirect deaths is, um, you know, is extremely high number between four to seven million, uh, 38 million displaced. You could imagine how many have been injured or, or suffered life, you know, life threatening injuries. Um, so this is this is through you know through warfare, but also you know one of the uh, one of the sources of tension between um, the U.S. and some of these states are, are policies like uh, the sanctions that the the U.S. imposed. You know, one of these forms of I mean, maybe you call it hard power or soft power, not direct military power, but it results in death, sanctions, and tariffs on the economies of the countries that they want to control. Um, and so we instituted these, um, I believe this is in Iraq, um, and it resulted in the deaths of over 500,000 children. Um, and, uh, and I just want 
you to hear from the mouth of the U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright uh, what come on uh, what she thought about the significance of that death toll, five hundred thousand Iraqi children. We have heard that half a million children died. I mean, that's more children than died in, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, that the price, we think the price is worth it. So super quick, you know, obviously she says some other stuff and she has a, a rationale. Um, and she thinks somehow, some way, right, 500,000 dead children is worth it. There's some political objective, right? There's something that we want as a state. Um, and 500,000 dead children is not too high a price to pay. Um, so this is this is that this culture of violence, um, you know, of control, of hegemony through through warfare. Um, and that's that's just one iteration of it and, and part of the you know, the, the human face behind it. Um, these are human actors who impose these policies and feel a sense of justification to do so. Um, and I just, you know, we can't get through something on imperialism without mentioning the, the military industrial complex, a concept some of y'all might be familiar with, uh, but just a, a, you know, one definition of this. Um, the military industrial complex refers to the mutual benefit enjoyed by the state and arms contractors as weapons manufacturers subsidized by the government to immense profit for the firm and its stakeholders, who much of the time are politicians themselves. Um, and these same firms make donations uh, to friendly war hawks, 83 million campaign donations uh, from, from weapons manufacturers in the last two uh, election cycles. Uh, the state benefits from war by stoking profitable production, including the export of weapons. Um, you know, there there have been instances where the U.S. is fighting a country and also selling it arms, right? Um, excusing, you know, giving a, a rationale for wartime tax hikes and extending their, you know, economic and, and diplomatic power through the war itself. All these factors and more motivate the state to engage in war and the companies and people who profit off of war to encourage it. And so you can see this chart, uh, military expenditures by country, um, the US, right? Just look at the, the amount of the chart that it takes up in terms of its expenditure, in terms of billions of dollars. Um, the US uh, is home to 4% of the world's population, 4% uh, of the world's population, but look at, uh, about the amount of military expenditures that we account for. Um, you know, it's not half, but it's uh, it's a massive, wildly disproportionate number. Um, and that's part of our, our imperialist culture. Um, just some, you know, some some facts worth noting. The, the 2024 defense budget is $886 billion, uh, more than twice as much adjusted for inflation as at the time of Eisenhower's warning against the MIC. So the military industrial complex is a term that he used in a speech in 1961. It preceded him, but he he popularized it. Uh, that number is more than half the federal discretionary budget, leaving priorities like public health, environmental protection, job training, and education, and others uh, to compete for whatever remains. And in 2020, Lockheed Martin, one of these arms manufacturers, received $75 billion in Pentagon contracts, more than the entire budget of the State Department and the Agency for International Development combined. Um, the average taxpayer, right, you and I, uh, spends $1,087 per year on weapons contractors, compared to $270 for K-12 education and just six, six bucks for renewable energy. So this is how you and I are involved, and this is how our money is being used. This is the breakdown. And uh, I'm not one to look to to uh, to U.S. presidents for moral advice, but I mean, you know, hear it from this guy, from, from Eisenhower in a, a speech earlier in 1953. He said, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. Mm. The Chance for Peace is the, the title of that speech. And so we can see, right, the, 
the way these these all these things are interconnected the colonialist control uh of of other territories the violence it requires um the profit incentive of capitalism uh the way these things are are intertwined in in the imperialist project um and how you and i are are deeply involved in that reality um i want to i want to close with a, a speech from a veteran someone involved um, in these wars to just see what what some of you know someone who's actually participated in these wars thinks the sound is not coming through the sound's not coming through no can you hear it at all or is it just no. really quiet? No. Why is that the case? There's sometimes a setting in which your computer audio won't play for others to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Setting is the... Are you screen sharing or sh yeah, you're sh if you try sharing, sharing it all. What's that? Say and that again. Usually, if you try sharing it as a tab, um, so you have to stop the screen share. Why won't it let me go back to? It's like okay. Let's try this. Yeah. Let's see if oh, that girl was there. Last share time. it as a tab, and then you should have the okay. option. So. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. There's something. I think we got it. Oh, come on. <laughs> Let me do a plug for a group called About to Fail. Okay. Against the War. It actually, oh, we could hear sound for about five access. seconds. Yeah, it was. It was cool. Yeah, it just worked. But the sound stopped when the video stopped, froze. Yeah. Oh. Um, okay. Well, here's what I'm gonna do. Give us the blank and we can um, look at it. I mean, we could just read the captions too. Here, yeah, let me I'll stop share and I'll throw this in the Right in the chat. Uh, chat. And y'all can can watch it and we'll just we'll meet back in five minutes and and just close. I'll just offer a couple of questions for us to leave with. But um yeah, watch that and then we'll gather back here. And uh like mute yourselves while you watch it. My screen in the no, chat no, go for it. says video unavailable, Connor. Sorry. That's Connor. That's article. Yeah. Down Must there. be this. Yeah. Yeah, it came up video unavailable for me. We got it. Susan Brothers, thanks everyone for being here. We got it. We are here to say to all those serving in the Army and the Marines and the Air Force and the Navy that you have the absolute right to refuse to take part in these criminal wars, and that's a right that all of you should exercise. You have no reason to go put your life on the line by telling lies to profits. We've been to Iraq. We've been to Afghanistan. And we know what these wars are really about. And we joined the military for many reasons. Because we need a college education. Because we need a job. Because we need health care. And then we joined the military. And they tell us that our enemies are poor people in caves in Afghanistan. Or poor people in the deserts of Iraq. And we fund those countries. And we know that our enemies are not other poor people abroad. Our enemies are the people that laid us off from our jobs. That denied us health care. To make it impossible to get an education. Our enemies are not in the poorest countries on the planet. But right here in the richest one. 
The occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan alone are costing over $700 million every single day. This is a crime. Every single day, while so many of us are hurting, well, I think all of us here and the vast majority of people in this country would agree that we can spend $700 million a day better than bombing people that we have no reason to bomb. We can spend $700 million a day rebuilding those countries we've destroyed. We can spend $700 million a day caring for the veterans we get home. When they get home, we can spend $700 million a day giving every single person health care, a college education, a job, a livelihood, and a home. That's who we need to be spending our money on. But this government is not going to do that. They're not going to use the money in that way. They're not going to end the wars. And they're not going to do it because it's not our government. It's their government. It's the government of the rich. It's the government of Wall Street, of the oil giants, of the defense contractors. It's their government. And the only language that they understand is shutting down business as usual. And that's what we're doing here today. And we're going to continue to do until these wars are over. It's crystal clear now that these wars are going to continue and expand and go into other countries. That is the trend. That is what we know that there is perpetual war and it's only gonna stop if the people stand up and stop it. And that's what we're going to do, sisters and brothers. A lot of people ask me, what do we do? Because we all know things are bad. We all see the atrocities on TV. We read about it, we experience it. People always ask, what do I do? You always want to know what to do. Do we vote? Do we support a politician? Uh, what you know? Do we join an organization? What do we do? Well, I'll tell you what we do. It's simple. We fight. We fight and we fight and we fight and we shut down our workplaces. We shut down our schools. We shut down the streets. We shut down business as usual and we fight until we force the people in there to do what the people out here want. And that's what we're going to get out here to fight. And no one's got one more. Not one more time, a soldier coming home in a wheelchair. Not one more family slaughter. Not one more day of U.S. imperialism. Let's fight to make that happen. We can do it today. I'm going to day the head. We have to fight to end these wars and create a better world system, brother. Ooh, they're going to kill him. <laughs> yeah. My, my. Yeah. So. Um, I hope folks, I was, we were listening to it through, uh, through your audio, Rich and Diane. So hopefully other folks heard that too, or, or were able to watch it on their own. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, this, this, uh, these are things that people who are actually on the ground, right. And experiencing war, carrying it out. Um, these are things that they apprehend too. Um, there are organizations like About Face, uh, which is uh, an organization of veterans against war, um, having experienced it and uh, now devoting their lives to ensuring that it never happens again. Um, so I just the last thing I want to leave us with are, are just a set of questions. If I can if I can do this without everything messing up again, I think it's over here. Um, like, let's go. Why not? It's just not letting me. <laughs> what? Anybody have any idea why it's doing that? Did you feed it dinner? It doesn't like <laughs> you. It's an imperialist. <laughs> it's an imperialist. <laughs> yep, they got in. Yeah, yeah, it's the FBI shutting this down. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay ah, here we go yeah. they got scared okay um yeah i mean so these are just these are just questions just orbiting you know in our minds and stuff um his his answer was was i don't know not super exciting right he was like building it up like he was really gonna tell us what exactly to do and then he told us to fight like okay <laughs> yeah yeah of course um, but yeah, shut down your businesses, shut down your schools, business as usual. Absolutely. But okay. What exactly does that look like? We're, I'm going to try to offer some of that as we move, uh, forward in the study, but for us to just sit with some of these questions as we go, how do we undo this bipartisan culture of war, right? This is, this isn't something that maps on to a particular political party. 
one isn't more bloodthirsty than the other um right there are, each administration is is engaging in war um each one is you know exercising drone warfare the hard power the soft power whatever it is i mean uh, our country functions uh, it, it requires this military industrial complex I mean, both parties um, are complicit. So how do we develop a moral and political alternative to U.S. hegemony and its imperialist impulse, which drives it? How do we disrupt the flow of money and political will into new zones of war? How do we ensure that our country will no longer assert its profiteering desires over the interests of other countries and peoples? Um, I think this is the set of questions um, but we, you know, as Christians, as peace loving people, um, as aspiring peacemakers need to be able to address um, in serious ways and practical ways. And, um, and uh, hopefully we can get there together. So thank you all so much uh, for tonight, especially those, uh, those folks who contributed a lot of wisdom and knowledge. Thank you so much um, and look forward to seeing you all really soon and, and uh, at the very least, hopefully next weekend. I mean, next, uh, next week for the study when we meet again. So um, thank, thank you for being here nice. and have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, y'all.